Hi guys, this is Brittany from Canadian Beats, and I have a Ralph on the line with me. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. Just getting ready to head back out on the road tomorrow. Ooh, that's so exciting, though. I can't imagine what it's like to be out. Yeah, it's exciting, and it's um, you know, it's it's, it's funny coming back to Toronto and like having this little beat, you know, where all of a sudden I can kind of like I'm at home again, and I'm like my friends and my family and then it's like wait no I'm not actually here I'm, <laughs> I'm off on the road again oh, so, um, sure. yeah it's it's funny it's funny it's definitely like, funny like having a home as a stop on the uh on the way but it's cool it's good it's, it's nice to have like a second to just like relax and chill and then get back on the road I know that when you first were getting into music a lot of your music was disco and kind of techie so how did you go from a disco flair to introducing R&B and like heavier beats into your music um, well, I think, like, the disco stuff was in there because, you know, when you think of, like, synth pop, and when I would go into a studio with a producer, um, they would just sort of automatically go 70s or 80s, um, and when I was kind of still, like, figuring out the project and what I wanted to do and who I was as an artist, I think, um, yeah, I was kind of going with that nostalgic flair a little bit more because it, it is an element, you know, the genre of music that I really love. I do love the oldies, and um, and it was really fun. But I I think, like, the reason that I've transitioned a little bit is just because, you know, as an artist, I'm growing, and I'm kind of learning what I want and what I want my music to sound like. And I listen to a lot of R&B and hip-hop. Um, so, uh, you know, I was like, why not try to incorporate more music that I'm listening to, you know? Um, into what I do um, and, and kind of create these like genre mashups a little bit more instead of just having it feel like all the songs are kind of of one era. Um, yeah, so it's just like naturally as an artist, you just like kind of grow and, and keep kind of like fine tuning who you are, what you want your music to sound like. And yeah, you know, you got to enjoy it. <laughs> so with your music growing, you actually just uh, released your debut album, A Good Girl. So what was the process behind creating and making this album? Well, um, I wanted to obviously put out a full length because the EP was only six songs. Um, and I wanted to, okay, so I, I felt like the EP, you know, it definitely like dealt with relationships um, in an autobiographical way. But I think that I largely kind of like wrote the songs from like a victim point of view kind of like oh this person did me wrong and um you know I didn't really talk about how in relationships you know they're multifaceted they're complicated you are not always the good guy um sometimes you are the heartbreaker and I wanted to explore that a little bit more on the album just kind of like be a little more realistic and honest about who I was as a person and and I think like to me, that's more relatable than someone who's like, oh, no, I'm always the one getting hurt. Like, I never do anything wrong, you know? I want to be more realistic and, and, um, and kind of write from an honest place. Yeah, it's about, like, I don't know, how complicated relationships are and um, how nothing is... There's just, like, no such thing as, like, you know, good or bad. Um, the, the whole concept of the album name was that it's, it's tongue-in-cheek, right? So I, I felt like when I was... Yeah, my, my entire life, I've always sort of been, like, pigeonholed as this um this like nice girl because I don't know maybe because I'm blonde <laughs> and middle class and uh you know my parents are nice and we were raised with like you know good morals I don't know I always just sort of felt like I got this like nice girl label and I I never wanted it I I was I didn't ask for that I think that like it's a lot of pressure to be kind of like good you know um so I wanted to create this album that just like talked about in a realistic way like the fact that I'm human and I fuck up and um I do I do shitty things and yeah I, just, I thought that was more relatable and, I, and as an artist I just kind of want to explore that context and those concepts a little bit more just more interesting than kind of constantly being like oh you hurt me I'm sad <laughs> no. <laughs> you know I totally get that so when you yeah. went through and you were making choosing the songs I guess for a good girl how did yeah. you know which songs you knew were going to make the cut, which w- verse, which ones would be specific to concerts, or which ones you were going to put on the back burner for another album? Yeah, that's honestly like one of the hardest parts is when you're writing an album, you write so many songs. And you know, there are some that like you write and you're like, meh, 
Yeah, I don't know if I love that one. But then there's, there's all the songs that you do love, um, or songs that you write and you love the idea of them, but you know that they're not quite there yet, and then you're like, shit, do I, do I really push to get this song ready in time for the album, or do I, you know, yeah, put it on the back burner? So, man, that was the hardest part. Um, I think, like, picking the songs, it was a team effort. Me, my manager, and my label kind of all put in our two cents. I sent it to like a million of my best friends being like, what are your favorite songs? Um, you know, and that's the hardest part of getting, like, you, I, I, I realized in the last year writing this album, I, I have really continued to learn how to trust my, my own gut because you get a lot of opinions, you know, from other people about songs and um, what should happen to the songs. And uh, yeah, I had to kind of like, definitely like listen to my you know my team but also be like if there's a song i feel strongly about i'm gonna fight for it so i felt really strongly about cereal i was like i love cereal i know it's not a hit but to me it's like a b-side hit you know it's a song that people are gonna listen to and appreciate even if it's not a dance like radio single yeah um so i fought i fought for cereal to to be on there because i felt really strongly about it um but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think, like, in the end, the songs that ended up on there are the songs that we felt the strongest about, the songs that were ready. Um, and they all kind of, we, the way that they're placed on the, the order of them, the, the album order list, is it's actually very intentional. We spent some time mapping it out. It's, it's kind of a chronological story. Uh, it's like a narrative in itself, I suppose, um, of a relationship. Uh, so it starts off. First and foremost, the most relationship, the one with yourself. Um, uh, so it starts off with that. And then it kind of, yeah, she sees this relationship unfolding and all the complexities of that relationship. And then it ends with serial, the end of a relationship. Um, so the songs that are on there just kind of like, they all made sense in that narrative. And I think that that's like primarily why they made the cut. But there are tons of songs that I would like to hold on to and potentially out at some point there's a couple that I, that I really love that didn't make it on the album so we'll see <laughs> we'll see them on the next one hopefully yeah I don't know it, it, it's really hard though you know you write like I, just, I have so many songs and it's so sad to think that like you might not ever use them for anything so I don't know I like to think that that um, if there's one or two that really you keep thinking about then you know there'll, there's a place for them somewhere okay very it's nice to hear that that's your thought process would you do it if you had some songs that you really loved but wouldn't do an album you would do them specifically say for like concerts yeah for sure like we weren't actually going to put bedroom eyes on the album it was just a fun song that we've been doing live for a while and then we were like trying to get we really were missing like this like bump and dance track that had like a really fast bpm and um we, we tried like you know like i wrote a couple with different producers and there were some good ones but all of a sudden, we were like, wait, like, Bedroom Eyes is, like, kind of a fan favorite. Like, people love Bedroom Eyes. Like, why are we not putting Bedroom Eyes on the album? Like, maybe we've just been, you know, ignoring the, like, solution the entire time. So, um, we got a kind of a producer, this young producer that I met in L.A., who's wicked, his name is Sire. Um, we gave it to him to just kind of, like, make a little bit more cool and a little more contemporary. He put in that crazy, like, sub beast that kicks in on the chorus. Um, so, yeah. He kind of gave it a little revamp and, and made it. <laughs> no, that's awesome. So, yeah. Ralph, my final question for you for the night is this year you've actually surpassed 15 million listeners on Spotify, which is a huge achievement in itself. So congratulations for that. Thank you. <laughs> and you're just continuing to grow. So what is it like to have so many listeners and know that you're a role model to so many different people in so many different situations and all over the world? Mm. I mean, it's both like, wicked and also like terrifying obviously um because being a role model and knowing that there are people who are watching your stories and you know mimicking what you do or or you know um yeah noticing what you do um it's it's uh yeah it's a lot of pressure um and like I said you know I am not perfect um and I don't want anyone to ever do something because they saw me do it, you know, um, just because, like, I'm someone who likes to smoke weed doesn't mean that I want my 12-year-old fans to do it, um, but, uh, yeah, I think, like, you know, when it comes to being a role model and, and, and being aware of people looking up to me, I think the best thing that I can do is just be, like, my honest self, 
um, you know, just be as, like, open and, um, yeah, and, and, and honest as I can. You know, I'm I'm getting more and more comfortable speaking up about, like, my own personal mental health issues and um, my struggles with body image in the past and eating disorders. And, you know, it, it's scary because I'm sure tons of people could, could – could use it against me, but I've been getting really valuable feedback from the fans who have, you know, lots of young fans who have written me messages um, being like, hey, thank you so much for talking about, you know, this, 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 and this. It's really connected with me as someone who also struggles with that. You have been, like, really inspiring or motivating or, you know, that that kind of stuff is wicked. Um, so, like, I, I, yeah, I, I, I'm getting more and more comfortable and, um, kind of like encouraged to speak up and use my platform as a way to kind of reach out to people and just like connect, I guess, um, and talk about my own personal experience. I never want to preach. Um, I was just talking to someone else about this the other day about how like I find when, when people are too preachy, it actually does the reverse, uh, result. I think when people preach to me, I find myself like really turned off. Um, it's like when someone's like, trying to preach veganism it's not that i don't appreciate veganism i just don't want someone telling me what i should do or that i'm a shitty person because i don't do what they do so um my you know the way that i see like if anyone ever asks me like once an interview asked me for like love advice like what's your dating advice and i was like oh god like i don't want to tell anyone to do anything because what the hell do i know about dating but except for that it's been on like a million dates um <laughs> Yeah, I just always talk about, like, my personal experience, I guess. And uh, and if people want to kind of, like, use that for their own um, their own stuff, then that's cool. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's a constant learning experience, I suppose. No, for sure. Yeah. But it's great when you're able to kind of notice your own imperfections, for lack of a better word, to know that there's yeah. stuff that you can do to grow and that you're not a perfect human and that people shouldn't be dependent on their pressure, role model. For sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think, like, you know, and the more people talk about that kind of stuff, the more other people, like, take a sigh of relief and go, oh, my God, okay, great. Like, I thought I was the only one. Um, I think, like, that's why, you know, I, I, I talk about, like, anxiety and trying to eat well, you know, because, like, people need to talk about that stuff so that, you know, people, like, yeah, I, I think, like, we should just be encouraging conversation all the time. And it doesn't mean that, like, you know, everyone has to talk about their, their the nitty gritty details of their lives. I totally understand that like we're all at different places with, you know, self like care and healing and whatever. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It's like the more I have people come forward and say like, thank you for talking about this. It like, you know, did this for me or it got me to do this, like encouraged me to do this. Like that's great. That's perfect. That's all I ever want, you know, in response to, to yeah and in response to that so yeah of course I'll, I'll, I'll keep doing it I guess <laughs> no for sure and that's all we ask is your fans <laughs> yeah exactly yeah um Ralph, be honest yeah for sure I want to thank you so much for taking the time to jump on the phone with me it was great to get to know you better and more about your music and who you are just as a role model to others so thank you so much oh my pleasure thank you for calling me yeah <laughs> of course <laughs>